All right, we're going to go ahead and get kicked off. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Rob Lee. I'm the Chief Curriculum Director here at the Sands Institute. And over the past uh, few weeks, and especially the pa uh, past few days, uh, we have seen a very sombering reminder of uh, how uh, fragile the world is, and especially when it comes to uh, what's going on in uh, Russia, Ukraine, all of Europe, and what people are feeling here in the United States. One of the key questions that the Sands Institute um, has been continually asked is, what do we do to prepare? You know, is there going to be cyber spillover? What is exactly the threat actors, uh, you know, capabilities? Uh, what is the history here? Um, and while we have an extensive history with Russian cyber uh, threats, uh, even going back in my own history, my first uh, nation state attacker that I ever investigated was a part of an investigation back in 1998 called Moonlight Maze, which was a, a Russian cyber threat actor that was targeting uh, DoD uh, installations. Um, it is without saying that obviously there's a lot of angst, uncertainty, and fear, uncertainty, and doubt uh, surrounding uh, the events that are currently taking place uh, in the Ukraine and abroad. Uh, you know, of course, our hearts go out to those individuals uh, that are affected by uh, the invasion and the current casualties that are going, currently going on as a result of the invasion of Ukraine. But today, what we'd really like to focus in on is talking about the Russian cyber threat, what we currently know about it, uh, what they have been currently been up to over the past several weeks, in addition to, you know, one of the key questions that a lot of people have, what is their true capabilities about uh, being able to affect the infrastructure, uh, not only in the Ukraine, but spillover effects that might and could occur in the European Union, uh, around the world, and here in the United States. Joining me today, uh, we have three experts. Uh, they're extremely well known around the world. Kevin Hovot. Uh, uh, Jake Williams and, and Tim Conway. Uh, we're going to be kicking things off uh, with Kevin Hovum. Uh, Kevin uh, is currently uh, leading up a cyber threat intelligence cell that is helping inform uh, the Center for Cybersecurity in Belgium and across uh, the European Union. Uh, he was uh, personally recommended uh, by Pay Katie Nichols, who, when I initially asked if she was interested in doing this, he, uh, she basically said, uh, Kevin is the person you want doing this. Uh, looking at Kevin's slides and uh, moving through this, uh, Kevin is one of our leading cyber threat intelligence analysts, and he has extremely detailed information about the Russian cyber threat. So without further ado, I would like to kick it over to Kevin. Now, be one last uh, thought here. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A, uh, and we'll address the questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, so please put your questions in the Q&A and we'll address the questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I want to introduce uh, Kevin Holvo. Thanks a lot, Rob, for the introduction. Is uh, sound good? It's great. All right, awesome. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you for welcoming me. And as you said, I am indeed the lead for the Threat Research Center within the CITRUS department, which is then the CTI department and led by uh, my boss, Pedro. Thanks a lot for that introduction. Now, when we go into Russia's cyber capabilities, we'll look over a couple of things today. I won't handle everything. I mean, it's too short to do everything in here, but I'll just go over the little points, the most interesting and most important points you need to know about Russia's cyber capabilities. Next slide, please. Now, at first, I want to show you the kind of mapping between the APTs, the Advanced Persistent Threat Groups that we have observed in the past and are still observing these days, and the mapping that we sometimes can see, you know, after attribution with the different security and intelligence services in the Russian Federation. The first one you can see here on the left, which is under the president of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin himself, that's the SVR or the Foreign Intelligence Service. Now, under that, there are a couple of departments, a couple of directorates, and one of them is the Cyber Operations Center, which APT29 has been attributed to. So if you see any APT29, Cozy Bear, or any of the Dukes kind of activity, you're probably getting attacked by the Cyber Operations Center. On the right, you can see the uh, Ministry of Defense, and under that, we have the GRU. 
Uh, for us, that is mainly the main intelligence directorate, right? Um, there we see multiple groups. We see APT28. We also see Sandworm, which we'll look into a little bit later in the slides today. Um, next slide, please. Then the third one is the FSB, the Federal uh, Security Service. And in there we see Gamaredon, which is also uh, very important, has been um, dealing with a lot of activity these days. We have Turla, I think one of the oldest APTs in Russia, if not the oldest one uh, that we saw. And there's a couple of other names over there that you can see. And the last one is the FSO or the Federal Protective Service. At the moment, no APT groups have been attributed to this service, but who knows, maybe we'll find something later when we do more attribution. So what can we learn from this? Only from this graphical, this infograph, so by the way, thank you for the author of this. Uh, the, there is a large amount of advanced activity groups that are operating from Russia uh, against the rest of the world. These things, these couple of activity groups that we see here have been attributed to different departments and sections of the Russian security and intelligence services. Um, for example, with the GRU and the FSB, we even see that they have some kind of a relationship with cyber criminal groups and hacktivist groups. What are they actually exactly doing? Are they forcing them to do something? Are they paying them? Are they asking them? We don't know for sure, but they do seem to have some kind of relationship with a couple of cyber criminal and activist groups. And the last point I want to make is that it looks as if they seem to share some guidelines. I mean, they seem to share some modus operandi, some way of operating. Sometimes we even see sharing of tools um, between the different groups, which are linked to different departments. So are they partnering in this or do they have some competition, which is also a rumor that I've heard in the past um, between the departments, I don't know. Maybe we'll see that in the future. Next one, please. And what have we seen so far? I'll first go into the important activity groups we want to keep track of at the moment. There's actually one that I saw this afternoon, which has become very active. Uh, so CERT Ukraine has published information about UNC 1151, uh, which is apparently behind a misinformation and influence campaign and which is now sending this afternoon a lot of spear phishing, uh, spear phishing emails to the rest of the world, but of course, especially Ukraine. Thank you, by the way, Search Ukraine for sharing so much information. Now, the, one of the important ones is Sandworm. This one is known to have or to be uh, attacking Ukraine and others with very destructive attacks, right? They have been active since at least 2009, maybe earlier, but then we don't really see any destructive attacks going on there. Who knows, maybe more information later on. Now we have APT28 and APT29 attributed to either the GRU or SVR, and they seem to be dealing with a lot of espionage campaigns all over the world. I mean, we've seen them in Europe, we see them in the United States, we see them all over the place. If they have an interest in you, they will try to do some espionage on you and steal your information. These are active since 2004 and 2008. Then a new one that we've seen and that has been attributed by Microsoft is the DEF 0586. Now this one is related to the destructive Viper attack Whispergate that we saw on the 15th of January. Jake will tell you more on that one later on. So let's go into the next activity group, which is Gamma Redden. Gamma Redden is a group that seems to be operating from Crimea, so very close to Ukraine, if not within Ukraine, you know, depending on who you're talking with. And they target the Ukrainian government specifically. They try to target officials and organizations, and all of those targets seem to be aligned with Russian interest, with Russian strategy. The last one is Bootrap. Uh, that is a very special group, which has started as being a criminal group targeting uh, financial organizations. But now they seem to have shifted and are kind of attacking in state interest. They are still going after financial, uh, financial organizations, but the way they're doing it seems to be related more to state actors or state activity. Next, please. Then in the uh, cyber attacks that we've seen, we've seen multiple cyber attacks in the last two months, even more since September, since the whole deal with NATO started. 
But um, one of the most important things that we have been dealing with uh, in Europe and in the rest of the world, and especially in Ukraine, I mean, the amount of attacks that they've done there uh, are the following attacks. So first one, DDoSs against government, military, financial institutions, telcos, ISPs, doesn't matter. I mean, if you're of interest to attack you, to stop you from broadcasting anything, they will DDoS your environment. Destructive wipers, we already went into that a little bit. Whispergate on the 13th of January, 2022, and Hermetic Wiper on the 22nd of February. I mean, this week. Then we have some espionage attacks that also happen against Ukraine, but also internationally. Look at the CISA alert that was published a couple of days ago, where they warned about Russian state actors doing espionage attack against the Department of Defense or at least military targets. Now we have the defacement of websites, which has been very big. And there was even a supply chain attack um, at the Kitsoft company. So what apparently happened, the Kitsoft company was compromised by these attackers and the, their administrative privileges towards the websites, towards the websites hosted uh, by, the, by the Ukrainian government uh, were then defaced and had the message that you can see on the right on those websites. Next one is op influence operations. A lot of influence operations and disinformation campaigns are going on in the last couple of years. But now this has increased a lot. I mean, the amount of disinformation and influence operations that we see these days is magnificent. Um, they even use things like SMS messages towards citizens telling that ATMs are not working and just making people crazy like, oh no, I need to get some money, right? Uh, so these things are happening through SMSs, social media, and any other media channel they can use. Uh, we've even seen information or disinformation and information operations against their own citizens, like trying to say, we are doing a good job and we should attack Ukraine for this or this or that reason. Also, be aware of false flags operations. If you're looking into this information, if you're looking at, sorry about that, if you're looking about uh, certain things, Beware of uh, false flag operations. For example, in Whispergate, it seems that everything was pointing to a pro-Ukrainian hacking group. Um, because of the link, the 80% overlap in code with white black crypt ransomware, which in some you know, couple of links has been attributed to Ukraine's special services and armed forces. So they are trying to co you know, go in that direction, but beware if you're doing any investigation. Next one. And here I'm trying to make an overview in the, with the MITRE attack matrix, uh, an overlap matrix for the six groups that I mentioned. So the UNC 1151, you'll have to add that there. Uh, I also didn't include the sub techniques because otherwise my slide would go crazy, but it's just good to know and good to do in your own environment to just have these overlaps, to look at them and to see what are the most important things we need to protect them against. For example, command and scripting interpreter. If you see anyone manually doing any commands or manually doing any PowerShell, uh, Linux shell, or whatever on your workstations, and normally your users aren't doing this, then you should maybe flag this and alert on that. Same for phishing. A lot of phishing is being used against the users to target them and to make them install something. That's where you see the user execution. They're, they're just socially engineering the, your users to click on something. Um, so look at the red parts in here and go, uh, go further. Try to map that to your mitigations. Try to map that to your defenses. Next slides. Here are some resources. I won't go into this, but here are some resources to follow the situation. CERT Ukraine, as I mentioned before, is doing an awesome job at sharing information. You can go on their Facebook, on their Twitter, but also on their website. They have really great articles. Just use some Google Translate if you can't speak Ukraine. I'm doing it myself uh, for the last couple of weeks and it actually works great. Um, then we have national, uh, national CERT websites from your own country. For example, the Center for Cybersecurity Belgium also has a couple of websites that you can go to to find information on what's going on. Uh, here we are looking at CISA, for example, in the United States with alerts and also the known exploited vulnerabilities catalog, which is a very important one to look at when you're prioritizing your vulnerability management. We can never forget SANS Internet Storm Center, public media outlets, if you're following geopolitical situations, MitreTech and the CIS controls. Next, please. 
And then to conclude this, uh, we can say that Russia by itself is a powerful actor, also a powerful cyber actor, right? So oh, two things, they seem to combine and they seem to use this kind of hybrid attack strategy where they, in cyberspace, will use multiple techniques, multiple attacks like DDoSs and malware attacks, destructive attacks, and so on and so on, all at the same time, very coordinated, very strategically um, done in, in, a, in a good way. It's always with purpose that they do it. And they seem to combine it these days also with the physical attacks against Ukraine since yesterday, unfortunately. Now, they do have long-term experience. As Rob already said, Moonlight Maze was attacking the US uh, since 1996. Well, not Moonlight Maze, it was Turla, but the case is called Moonlight Maze. So they have been able to build um, very for a very long time to build their cyber capabilities and especially their offensive cyber capabilities. Uh, they use a lot of different TTPs, but try to use that overlap matrix to see what the most important things are. Now, these days, most attacks are against Ukraine, but we do see that uh, in Europe and in the rest of the world, there are some attacks that are ongoing for one reason or another. And do never forget things like NotPetya, where we saw a lot of uh, collateral damage. I mean, this thing, for example, for Marsk and a bunch of other countries worldwide, some say that it costs about $10 billion. And last but not least, prepare your defenses. You know, stay structured, stay calm, keep on preparing your defenses and share your information with the community. Thank you. Back to Rob or to Jake. All right, thank you. Uh, extremely helpful to be able to map out uh, the long-term uh, history of the cyber threat uh, from Russia and be able to connect the dots of what is currently going on. Um, like I said, my first case that I worked on was Moonlight Maze uh, as a nation state attacker. Um, and it's just a phenomenal just to see what's been going on for the uh, history here. Um, that analysis was spot on. Uh, leading up next is Jake Williams, who's gonna be walking through the current uh, and known mm -hmm. Russian cyber activity and some of the myths surrounding it. Uh, for those of you who do not know Jake Williams, uh, he's a former operator uh, in from the DOD. Uh, he's one of these few individuals that I honestly could say has been there and done that in almost every single type of cybersecurity uh, analysis, activity, operations, offensive malware analysis, incident response, threat hunting, ransomware, and all of the above. Jake is one of those individuals that if you really want to know what's going on, you turn to Jake and say, Jake, you know, what, what's your current lay of the land? And not only will he tell you uh, what's currently going on, he'll also tell you his opinion about it, which is extremely helpful because a lot of people are afraid to actually lean in and saying, hey, you know, this is going on, but it's not as big as a deal as most people are making it. Uh, so I truly uh, lean on Jake for a lot of advice when uh, these incidents come in. And Sans has relied on Jake for leading not just this urgent webcast, but for many emergency webcasts in the past. Without further ado, uh, Jake Williams. Hey Rob, appreciate it, uh, definitely. Um, so I wanna start here briefly by just discussing the uh, the hacktivists, uh, and I put that in quotes obviously, because you know we, we don't know, right? As, uh, as Kevin mentioned, we obviously have the potential for false flag attacks. Uh, you know, Russia has uh, been at the forefront actually of documented false flag uh, cases, uh, whether, you know, we're talking about an Olympic destroyer um, a few years ago, um, you know, all the way up, uh, obviously, uh, through Whispergate. Um, and so, you know, we have some evidence already of some hacktivism in place. Um, and, uh, you know, one of these I just wanted to call, you know, call attention to um, is this free civilian. Uh, they've been very busy, right? And they have a dark website. I'm, I'm not linking it here for, for, I think, pretty obvious reasons, but um, it's a dot on the inside anyway, but, but they've been fairly busy. They're claiming that the data of these Ukrainian citizens is for sale. They've compromised a number of different, a uh, number of different organizations. Um, these are large dumps. The data is unconfirmed though, right? So um, I expect to see more claims of these data dumps, um, you know, over the next, uh, next couple of weeks. Uh, they are posting some links already, um, although, you know, they're of course password protected files, right? They, they don't really want you in many cases to, to actually look at and vet the data. Um, and, and this leads me to believe this is probably another one of these influence operations. Uh, whether or not they've actually compromised that data or not is, is, is insignificant, or the data they claim is insignificant. Um, you know, the, the claim itself uh, makes Ukraine appear weak. And, and posting links, you know, you get to Mega and there are 
multiple 10 gig downloads that you could you know could pull down and uh you know again it 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 really does make ukraine appear weak it does distract from other ongoing attacks that may be more directly attributed to russian uh you know to russian uh, intelligence services that Kevin briefed us about. Um, and of course, it demonstrates that, quote unquote, private actors are responsible for attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure as well. Uh, can you advance the slide there for the buildup? Perfect. Yeah, and so you can see here, this is a, and by the way, this is a partial list of some of these new leaks. And advance one more for me. Yeah, perfect. And so then you see here again, uh, you know, some supposed dialogue going on here that this is clearly meant to uh, mock up you know, one of the ransomware uh, double extortion style sites like Happy Blog or, or that type of thing. Next slide, please. So I do want to talk a little bit about the malware that we've seen. Um, you know, Kevin talked a bit about, um, you know, we've seen Whispergate. We obviously saw some new, uh, some new, very new, actually, in the last couple of days, uh, you know, malware uh, come in as well, uh, wiper related malware. I, I want to call out a commonality that, that you know, a couple of folks uh, and some in the industry seem to have missed. Um, and that's that we see Russia again operate, operationalizing signed device drivers uh, for their wiper malware. We've seen this now on multiple occasions, right? Um, you know, a uh, you know a very obvious case of that would be the kill disk uh, malware that was used um, in the 2015 attacks on Ukrainian uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, power uh, distribution. Um, and this week's Hermetic wiper uh, used a different set of drivers or a different driver uh, from Ease US uh, using Partition Master. This is important because Microsoft, uh, back in the day, uh, went ahead and uh, set up uh, basically what we call patch guard or kernel patch protection. Um, and so this only allows, uh, or as part of that control, they only allow digitally signed device drivers uh, to load into, into the Windows kernel. Well, if I want to do great wiping operations, and I don't mean like generic ransomware where I'm going to go encrypt a couple of files, uh, not to downplay the, the risk of ransomware, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, if I want to go in and uh, screw up the master boot record, right? Uh, if I want to go in and start really uh, making recovery difficult, uh, extremely difficult, um, then I, I need to get something into the kernel. And so we've seen this technique of basically embed a signed device driver from another organization um, and then load that. Uh, we've seen that used uh, used repeatedly. Um, so and this one's an interesting one as well from a timing perspective because this new Hermetic wiper, it's being uh, named this uh, because of a stolen digital certificate from Hermetica Digital. Um, and of course that, that certificate's now been revoked. Um, but uh, this first observed sample was compiled December 28th. Um, now this gives us some insight. Uh, by the way, for those that aren't familiar with this, uh, there's a compile timestamp um, in portable executables, uh, not .NET, uh, but most uh, most PEs uh, have a uh, basically have a compile timestamp, and so we can see the metadata now uh, points us to December 28th is, is when this was built. This can obviously be modified, um, but uh, in this case, I, I don't think it's likely uh, likely that it was given the timing here, um, and uh, of course as well, uh, probably worth mentioning um, that. Uh, <clears throat> As well, uh, probably worth mentioning here on the, on the timestamp um, that uh, it wasn't seen in virus total up to that point either. So it looks like this tool was prepped earlier, digitally signed with that Hermetica uh, signature. We saw another sample uh, that was compiled on February 23rd. Um, so my takeaway from this is that Russian threat actors are quickly retooling. But my takeaway here is if you have tooling that supports it and you consider yourself to be high risk for wiper operations, for instance, and we'll talk a bit about that in a second, but if you, for instance, are operating in Eastern Europe, and you think that you're in at high risk for this, if you can prevent the loading of only, uh, basically of any unknown device driver, um, that may be uh, a decent uh, route to take here because we've seen now repeated use of these digitally signed device drivers, right? So they're not gonna show up as malware, the, dri the driver itself, uh, but if you can prevent that load, uh, that, that may save you in some cases. Next slide, please. Perfect. I want to talk quickly about the domains, right? Um, so we've seen a lot of domains that have been registered, and and I want to throw out here that uh, some, you know, some of these they're really not going out of their way here to really camouflage what's uh, what's going on. Uh, you'll notice here the who is uh, here for uh, Coagula .online. Um, You know they used reg.ru, right? So and I say they, uh, meaning uh, Russian threat actors. These have all been tied back to or attributed back to, uh, with at least moderate confidence, high in many cases. Uh, Russian government threat actors. And so, you know, here you see again, uh, you know, it's it's typically or typical today um, that uh, most who is data is anonymized anyway. Uh, here, now they don't even bother to do that. 
um, you know, they don't even bother going outside for a different registrar. Um, this is just reg.ru. And, uh, you know, I mean, it all but says we are GRU, um, you know, in this, uh, you know, or, or SVR. We are Russian intelligence uh, in this, uh, you know, the who is. Um, all that said, it is worth taking a look at, you know, the registration dates here. Um, and <clears throat> I think it's rather interesting, um, you know, that we're seeing a little bit of older infrastructure um, that, uh, you know, that may have been, uh, you know, may have been built, uh, built a little bit ago. Um, and, you know, we're also seeing some uh, also potentially, um, you know, seeing some uh, some other you know infrastructure that is, uh, and again, these may be domains that were taken over, for instance, coagula dot, uh, dot online, um, you know, may have previously been registered by somebody else, let go, and, and they picked it up. Uh, that's not entirely clear here. But again, you can see um, that there's been a lot of very recent activity within the last couple of months here for these domains that are being used. And I think the registration date kind of points to that. Uh, one tool that I would recommend taking a hard look at uh, if you're doing some uh, monitoring, you have the ability to monitor TLS certificates. Um, as they're uh, you know, traversing your network. Uh, census.io, C-E-N-S-Y-S.io, um, has a great uh, search tool available uh, for certificate transparency logs. Um, and uh, of course, since HTTPS is you know, at this point uh, pretty much ubiquitous, um, you get a chance to see um, you know, what ultimately, uh, basically how those certs are being issued. Now, a lot of these domains are hiding behind Cloudflare currently. Um, and uh, I would expect in the coming days or, uh, you know, days or weeks at the outside, uh, Cloudflare to get a little bit better at, uh, you know, uh, fronting, uh, yeah, fronting these domains. Um, so all that said, next slide, please. So I also want to note here about scans against Ukrainian IP space. Uh, gray noise, outstanding, outstanding service. Um, absolutely love this for, for reducing your noise floor and your network analysis. They are providing a free feed, hats off to these folks, a free feed of IP addresses that are only being observed targeting their sensors in Ukrainian IP space. So these folks have sensors all over the world. Um, and here we're now looking at specifically where are they targeting Ukrainian IP space. Um, I've got the uh, the link for the feed in the slides there. I know these slides are getting published as well, uh, but I want to say thanks for them because you know here uh, it, it's worth noting that you know they've got some great data here, um, and it, it is not unforeseeable that these IP addresses may, may be reused in later operations. They may even be targeting you now and just avoiding gray noise as sensors. I, I doubt that, but but again, I'd, I'd want to have these and and be identifying these in my, uh, you know, obviously in, in my own network telemetry. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, real quick, uh, you know, I want to drop some of the FUD out here um, a little bit, but I also want to say don't get mirrors, right? Um, collateral damage, and we keep hearing questions. I'm hearing a lot of questions from executives on quote unquote spillover attacks, right? And what they're really referring to is, hey, am I at risk from not Petya happening again? Right, uh, collateral damage from the 2017 NotPetya attacks. They obviously demonstrated, um, you know, the risk of unfiltered business-to-business -business VPNs, um, and the situation has unfortunately not improved that much today. Any mass spillover event like NotPetya will rely, like NotPetya, on automated propagation, and so your action items are right here. And I know Sands is publishing some collateral on this as well, but but this is it: inventory your B2B VPNs, block high-risk profile or high-risk protocols on those, and I've got a list of my top high-risk protocols there. Um, <clears throat> implement NetFlow monitoring on all your egress and on all your egress points. If you can only do one thing today, it's that. Go turn on NetFlow and start logging it today. Sooner or later, CISA is going to release, CISA or some other uh, you know, uh, government agency or, or, or provider is going to release a set of indicators that will include network data. You will be asked, were we targeted? Were threat actors successful in getting into our network based on these indicators? And you want to have that data. Turn that on now. You can do that before you go home today without any question. Turn on that NetFlow collection. I want at least 90 days looking back, right? I can't, can't undo the past, but I can turn it on now. If you have it on now, but don't have 90 days, let's up that, uh, up that threshold. Drive space is cheap. This doesn't have to go into Splunk. It doesn't have to go into anything super expensive. Literally, you could go out to Best Buy, buy a $300 laptop, throw an external hard drive on it, and start logging NetFlow on the majority of, of, of small, medium business uh, you know, egress, uh, egress points. So next slide, please. I want to quickly talk about targeting. As Rob mentioned, I've sat on the other side of the keyboard, right? Um, I'm not just you know, pontificating here about 
you know, uh, you know what what I think or what I might have read in a book or whatever, um, have a little bit of experience here, right? And I like to think about threats as that intersection of intent, opportunity, and capability. Um, you know, Kevin covered uh, capability. Um, opportunity is is really what we have uh, or what we present to the threat actor. Um, what I want to highlight though is intent, and I haven't seen a lot of this in public reporting. As you speak to your executives, your stakeholders let's really bring down the FUD level a bit, right? Your Russian government operators are really busy right now, right? The extent to which they may have done some retaliatory targeting, uh, you know, lots of retaliatory targeting for US and EU sanctions, um, that all changed and their prioritization around it all changed the second they rolled in, uh, you know, rolled into Ukraine um, and began conducting combat operations in Ukraine. They are really, really busy right now with really important government targets. Hacktivists may have time to kill, but the good news is that's largely going to be DDoS until the situation on the ground changes, uh, combat operations stabilize, the targeting is largely going to be around NATO um, and certainly uh, other European Union government agencies to the extent that they're targeting any civilian agencies or civilian uh, targets, uh, you know, with large scale destructive cyber attacks, I'd be looking at places geographically that makes sense for you know bringing reinforcements into uh, into Ukraine, so Poland, Romania, etc. Right? If I had uh, a large operation in Romania, like a lot of folks have outsourced MSSPs, yeah, that's a place I definitely be looking um, and definitely be thinking about those uh, you know those impacts. But honestly, not here in the U.S. Right? Uh, at least not for the foreseeable future. A couple of weeks, possibly more, until things stabilize. Time is on your side here. Next slide, please. If retaliatory cyber attacks are performed, um, again, they're gonna need to balance the following. And if an executive asks you about this, just push them back to this five point test, right? And then step back and ask, do we likely sit inside this five point test, right? There's a fairly, the intersection of those points leaves some fairly narrow sets of targets. I know that our nightmare scenarios are taking down utilities, taking down hospitals, et cetera. This might be possible. It's certainly, I should say might be, it certainly is possible, but it violates number two and, and largely number five, right? Um, and so again, if we begin ground or air operations, um, you know, in uh, obviously in, in Ukraine um, or, or in, you know, basically uh, fighting Russia, uh, obviously this, this assessment is going to change. Uh, but today, this is my assessment. I would assess that unless a particular target meets those five criteria, it's not a likely target uh, you know, for Russian government threat actors. And with that, um, I know it's been a whirlwind here, but with that, I'm going to turn it back to Rob to introduce Tim to talk about critical infrastructure. Thanks, Jake. Um, I don't know if you uh, saw this, but right either right before this webcast or right after uh, we started, um, uh, news broke that the Conti team is officially announcing full support of the Russian government. If anyone will decide to organize a cyber attack, or any war activities against Russia, we are going to use all possible resources to strike back at critical infrastructure of an enemy. That's from their leak site. Can you I comment on that? That's, yeah, I don't think that that's that surprising to me. Um, I think we've always known that there's a tight, uh, you know, a tight correlation between, um, you know, obviously Russian uh, Russian intelligence services and some of the ransomware actors that call, you know, that call Russia home. Um, no, no different than, you know, uh, in the U.S., we have a very strong cybersecurity presence uh, drawn from, you know, the Department of Defense and uh, other intelligence agencies. So that they would be similarly aligned there doesn't surprise me at all. Okay, thank you. Yes, Next sir. up, uh, you know, diving right into what does that mean to attacking critical infrastructure? Uh, you know, we have our leading expert, uh, Tim Conway, who has spent a um, massive amount of time in Ukraine helping shore up their critical infrastructure, uh, you know, going all the way back as, as some of the early attacks um, uh, with Black Energy and others. Uh, Tim's experience in leading the uh, in, uh, industrial control systems curriculum, uh, it goes without saying, uh, without uh, individuals like Tim, his experience, and uh, those that came before, especially Mike Asante uh, and the team that uh, he put together with Robert and Lee and Dragos and others, uh, critical infrastructure protection via cybersecurity is one of the most asked questions that SANS is receiving today, especially as the escalation of uh, the invasion continues and the question of cyber spillover that Jake mentioned uh, is addressed. Uh, Tim is going to uh, talk about this and walk you through uh, what is needed to know now uh, and what you should be really concerned about, uh, just like what Jake was saying, 
in terms of what we currently know today uh, from what we're seeing uh, for the current uh, escalation of events in Ukraine. Tim? Thank you, Rob. Just making sure you can hear me. Yes. Good. All right. Uh, very generous introduction. I appreciate it. Um, before we dive into some discussions of uh, past attacks, adversary capability, I recognize across the thousands of folks who are joining us today, uh, many may be hearing industrial control systems for the first time. They may hear terms like operational technology for the first time, and even the concept of critical infrastructure. I just wanna spend uh, 30, 40 seconds on a couple of slides to say, when we're talking about critical infrastructure, there's a number of electric utilities, healthcare, transportation, natural gas, oil, chemical, kind of the 16 critical infrastructure is defined in the US um, and abroad in the world, just uh, critical infrastructure, asset owners and operators. You may think about them from their IT information technology side of the house. Um, what I'm gonna be talking about is more on the operational technology side. So Rob, if you can go to the next slide. Um, we will just define those two things in as broad a term as we can. So if you're from the SANS audience and some of the thousands that are here joining us and you've heard of data, kind of uh, focus on data, data rest and storage or, or in a database or in a file system, data in motion across a network and data in use in a processor and memory space or in an application set. Um, think of that kind of in the information technology IT domain. As you think about operational technology, think about data that does something. So it has a physical kinetic element to the data. It is either representing the state of something in the field or the state of a process, or you have the capability to use it to manipulate the state of that process. So uh, thinking about IT and OT in those ways, and we're just gonna talk a little bit now about the OT or critical infrastructure elements. Next slide. I don't know if I have a bad internet, oh, there we go. <laughs> All right, so I bucketed these things into kind of three capabilities of uh, adversary groups and what are they targeting? Are they targeting confidence? And some examples there, kind of the Estonian 2007 attacks, very similar to what we've seen over the last uh, couple of weeks in Ukraine, impacting government websites, impacting government resources. Um, are they targeting elections, similar to what we've seen kind of in US? in 2016 and beyond uh, kind of the influence operations? Are they targeting kind of Ukraine as we've been seeing for years now, but escalating in anticipation of some level of action that uh, we started seeing yesterday? As you look through those kind of confidence-based attacks and what they're targeting in those, uh, those efforts, really trying to get to a point where causing a loss of confidence from a population in their government, and their government's ability to protect and defend and provide services that are necessary for citizens and uh, the public. As you move over into kind of moving from targeting confidence to targeting capabilities, and as you're looking at capabilities and access operations and sustained access and using systems and tools like uh, a solar winds or any number of other um, kind of security tools that you may employ and architect into your environment, but now being able to leverage those tools and that access so they can be misused to the adversary's uh, goals and deliver capabilities down and kind of entertaining that process across as we've looked through the solar winds events. And as you look at the attacks of NotPetya, kind of leveraging trusted communications and interconnected systems and interdependent systems and attacking that from a capability perspective to deliver and maintain access. As you look at VPN filter from uh, 2018, largely looked at as kind of attacking small home office devices around the globe, but an entire separate command and control system and channel set up with capabilities specific to industrial control system protocols that was only targeting Ukrainian critical infrastructure. And carrying forward from that, looking at that perimeter device as you would normally look at your architecture and understanding that that is a capability that when attacked and when compromised is no longer a perimeter device, but it is now a pivot device into an environment. Going towards the targeting from confidence to capabilities to control. And now you can look to things like the events in Georgia in 2008 and look at the coordinated cyber physical attacks. And if you are the target of Ukraine, you could look to what occurred in Georgia. You could look to what occurred in Crimea 
And you could say those were things that were a joint cyber physical operation and they were conducted in that way. And what lessons can we learn from those actions? And now we're seeing that playing out across Ukraine uh, as we speak today and starting last night, kind of moving through to strate strategic military sites, trying to gain control of critical infrastructure. Um, for a very long time, countries like Ukraine have been looking to how do we become more energy independent? How do we sort of position our system where we can sever from the Belarusian electric system and sever from the Russian electric system so that that can't be used as a target, that can't be used as a way to impact our critical infrastructure because we're relying on it for normal operation. And tests and plans were in place with tests expected and conducted on uh, the 23rd of February with an actual cutover for first time severing from the Belarusian system and Russian system planned for yesterday. Obviously, uh, incapable of being executed because of the actions that occurred. But looking to understand those lessons learned and act upon them, uh, absolutely of, of interest to all. Looking at the 2015 and 2016 events, kind of different parts of sectors being attacked. In 2015, the distribution electric system. In 2016, the transmission electric system. I'll talk about each of those in just one slide apiece uh, coming up here in a moment. And then advancing into additional types of capabilities and misuse of safety instrumented systems and protection systems where truly the globe should be worried about this. Those types of safety instrumented systems and operational technology environments, they are there for the purpose of protecting equipment, protecting humans. They're not there for normal control and for system automation. That is what the distributed control system and other technologies are for. So if adversaries are doing work in a safety instrumented system and developing capabilities, that is for a purpose of causing equipment damage or causing human loss of life. And as you progress through very specific elements like a VPN filter attack that now that has been identified and executed across some, a chlorine facility kind of in Ukraine impacting sort of uh, some of their operations in, uh, in mid 2018. And again, just kind of seeing how confidence capabilities and ultimately leading into control impacts can be demonstrated by this adversary group. Uh, next slide. When we talk about um, the two different types of attacks that sort of really opened up the picture to adversary capabilities and how they would conduct operations in critical infrastructure, a very common use case for lessons learned is the 2015 Ukraine attack. Three different organizations targeted in that attack, three different industrial control systems and uh, SCADA systems involved over 50 substations and targets in the field impacted, uh, 225,000 customers out, lots of field devices impacted from a firmware corruption perspective, loss of load, uh, so servicing customers, residential, business, 135 megawatts of load impact, and hundreds of servers and workstations impacted that had a direct effect on operations ability to restore service. Next slide. Again, that 2015 attack all focused on the Distribution, go back one, all focused on the distribution environment. And oftentimes kind of looking across some of the things that were covered by Kevin and covered by uh, Jake, looking at adversary actions and looking at it from one perspective of how do they operate from the IT preparations to the delivery and initial foothold, kind of the land and expand hunting and gathering elements, but then moving into the, how do we now with this position understand the operational environment. They are all unique in understanding how they operate, how, they can, how they're configured, and what needs to be done to achieve a goal will drive additional actions and drive kind of that understanding need and the engineered kind of specific attacks. The ultimate sequencing and pre-work, the attack position and the attack launch. You could also view this sort of timeline from the perspective of all of the available opportunities to the defenders at each stage, looking at what the adversary is going to be doing and what you could have uniquely done or can uniquely done to better position yourself to reduce the effects of a successful attack. Next slide. As we position to the 2016 attacks, just sort of understanding that in 2015, three different companies distribution, 2016, one organization that is a state owned and operated transmission system. 
but now the attack going towards the transmission level where 50 substations, 50 plus in the past, resulted in 135 megawatt load impact. Now on the transmission side, different system, different capabilities, single substation impacting 200 megawatts of load. And those attacks and using the attacks against those system and understanding how that power impact, that power flow isn't going to stop at country borders. Understanding that when you're attacking a transmission system, you need to understand power system dynamics that it is gonna flow into neighboring countries like Russia, like Belarus, if they're connected or flow into Poland or other uh, inner Thai countries if they are connected. So knowing the current state of the electric system and using that to inform your attacks, uh, very important based on your goals. Next slide. I'm getting uh, updates very slow. All right, so the one element in 2016 that I would call out, 2016, the attacks against the transmission system where 2015 was very manual, uh, very operator driven attacks. 2016, we saw the introduction of a modular malware capability being used in the attack. The capability of adversary groups and operators being demonstrated by this uh, country that indicates the rapid ability to load different industrial control system protocols into this framework and the ability to load in different exploits that would be necessary to achieve a goal on target within the industrial control system space. Uh, next slide. This next slide, again, I put this in here simply because the information is going to be all available to you. I'm not going to highlight all the roles here. Uh, we demonstrate the differences between the malware role in 2015 and 2016. 2015, highly orchestrated, highly targeted, um, highly coordinated, I should say. 2016, very targeted to a specific substation, very targeted to specific uh, devices in that substation on the protection side. Most significant elements, 2015, first public cyber attack on civilian power infrastructure. In 2016, the discovery of this modular malware and this framework to attack operational technology devices and industrial control systems in a very rapid way. Next slide. As Jake mentioned, kind of uh, what, you know, what to expect and um, for any of us to truly pretend and sort of try to, try to sell certainty in this model, um, it's, uh, it's a very unpredictable space. But uh, certainly, if you are within Ukraine, you would anticipate ongoing coordinated cyber and physical attacks from multiple adversary groups and potentially from other supporting nations. You should also expect some level of critical infrastructure impacts that enable invasion strategy and entrenchment. But more on the cyber side, uh, where possible, to avoid destruction of critical infrastructure that would then need to be repaired, replaced to support. Um, overall strategy of the uh, invasion. If you move towards the world view, so you're not in the direct conflict zone, you should anticipate obviously less of the physical presence as uh, you're not on direct border where the invasion is occurring or in country, but uh, you know, you're not kind of on completely the other side of the internet either. You're sharing an internet border. Um, as uh, ally nations sort of support Ukraine, as um, Russia looks to how can we impact and control and leverage critical infrastructure to our benefit, and other neighboring countries or supporting countries are looking to provide service and provide support or provide any level of help from a cyber to uh, natural gas needs to whatever it is, um, Certainly adversary groups here in Russia and other nations will look to impede the ability for critical infrastructure and other nations that are supporting Ukraine. You should expect some level of positioning capability validation uh, occurring now and obtaining information so effects based attacks could be achieved if they were necessary. Um, also, think beyond just the targeting of service outages. Most people from a operational technology critical infrastructure perspective think the worst thing in the world is an outage could occur. We could lose our power or we could lose our natural gas when we need it. Their focus is on outages and really just understanding as this continues to escalate, as this continues to progress, um, making sure we don't have a gap in imagination here. The worst thing that could happen is not outages. The worst thing that could happen is the system is kept up so it can be used to damage itself or damage load. 
And those are much longer term issues that would take a long time to recover from versus an outage that you could recover from with manual operations in a short period of time. We need to be comfortable with the discussion and understanding that outages are not the worst thing that could happen. Um, misuse of a system and equipment damaging attacks are the worst things that could happen. If you can go to the next slide. And I'm close to closing, just kind of continuing on that path. From a physical perspective, there are lots of things that could happen from a physical equipment damaging perspective, looking to the annexation of Crimea in 2014 and kind of the physical attacks on transmission towers uh, very kind of uh, present and understand what that means from a power flow and from a critical infrastructure. But for remote nations, remote countries, thinking about equipment damaging uh, attacks, talking about uh, from a cyber perspective and a physics perspective, using those controllers to cause equipment impacts. Thinking about disruption, operational impacts, equipment overwrites, bricking of embedded systems, or potentially using those systems to impact uh, service customers or uh, the equipment operation directly. Last slide. Last element is just, uh, again, more for a takeaway, but as you're considering kind of incident response, and here I've titled it operational response, and I've sort of used the traditional SANS uh, preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, and lessons learned model, and modified it from an operations perspective in regards to what things will matter the most during uh, an event. And some of those most important things from an information collection and identification of adversary presence in trying to eradicate, many of those things will be lower priority. And some of the initial priority on the operational containment is understanding where an adversary would need to be to achieve an effect and working towards moving that system in a uh, isolated or a manual control or a control inhibit model. Uh, to contain the effect that could be achieved. And then you could start to work through traditional uh, containment within the digital devices and the uh, IT or OT segments, but focusing on the mechanical process that's under control first to safe the system and move to a manual control at high criticality targets. Um, with that, I know we were hoping to save about 10 minutes for questions. So Rob, I will turn it back to you. All right, excellent. Uh, just a few more slides here. And we're good to go through. Um, oh, it says wrap up Tim Conway, but actually it's wrap up with me. Um, I had Lance Spitzner uh, do a quick slide about the human side. Um, Lance heads up our security awareness uh, uh, subject matter expert group. And, you know, it, it goes without saying, I had a couple of reporters ask me about this yesterday too. It's like, you know, what do, what do individuals need to worry about? You know, and, you know do they just say, hey, rely on the company to provide the defense, rely on your enterprises, you know, what do I need to do personally? You know, and just to remember, always go back to the fundamentals, especially in your security awareness programs. We're talking about that if ransomware is going to come in, if some of these attacks are gonna happen, they're still going to potentially use and likely use many of the, uh, you know, the human target uh, to be able to click on the thing, be an email, a link, um, you know, that is provided to you to get that initial access. Um, you know, if you need to, if you're an enterprise, um, you could always go through and double down on just doing a quick briefing for your employees, uh, especially right now, just to reemphasize the fact of, you know, be on the lookout for potential phishing, uh, you know, anyone who's trying to ask for your passwords, even by phone calls, uh, you know, any random updates to software. Uh, these things, you know, go back to the basics, you know, going back and, you know, uh, the basic cyber hygiene stuff that you need to worry about is important, especially if you're trying to say, what can we do? What can we tell our people to do? And what can you do personally when you're worried about these uh, attacks, you know, that could spill over uh, and you're worried about you potentially being a target? Uh, nothing uh, goes beyond just a quick refresher on uh, just, hey, you know, if it's going to come in, it's going to look surprisingly uh, familiar. But, you know, like I get a lot from, um, you know, my bank and they look really good, but in reality, uh, those things are definitive uh, phishing attacks on me. Um, the resources we're putting together, this webcast primarily focused in on the threat, uh, you know, with what Kevin uh, was able to put together, what the Russian activities are currently doing uh, that's out there, including, you know, what we just saw in the past hour with the Conti group uh, basically throwing down the gauntlet 
and uh, saying that if you attack Russia, we're you know behind Russia. Uh, we're going to meet, uh, you know, and uh, respond as well. And then we end up taking a look at what are the, uh, you know, key data points surrounding attacks on critical infrastructure, trying to really understand how that might look, how that might transpire. Now, beyond that, you know, what is the call to action here? What do we do? You know, what are the types of things? Jake had a list. We already posted that list. We have additional resources that, and webcasts that are going to be coming up, and we've created a blog that is going to be hosting these. Some of these items are already out on the blog. Uh, one of the things Joe Sullivan put together uh, yesterday is the CISO action items uh, in Ukraine cyber crisis, and then downloadable PDF of action items uh, to consider for leaders that are directly affected by the cyber crisis in Ukraine. Um, this is one of the things that we did at SANS that when this thing was kicking off earlier this week, I asked all the instructors, I said, hey, as we're moving forward in this, you are the security leaders of the community. What can we do uh, to help provide community resources? And if you're sitting on something you would like it distributed, let us know. This is one of those things that was put together. We also have a security communications template. Um, and this is again by Lance Bitzner, uh, you know, on the human side, really, what, how do we talk to our employees about this? How do we clear the FUD? How do we uh, be that steady hand uh, that we're all trying to be? Um, upcoming, uh, we have Mick Douglas and John Hubbard. Are, uh, there was a tweet that went out that went viral uh, uh, just yesterday, or actually two days ago, about you know if you're concerned about uh, uh, trying to make it as difficult as possible for any attacker, uh, you know if there's spillover or not from the Ukrainian crisis that's currently going on. Uh, I asked Mick if he's interested in taking those six tweets and make them into a long form PDF and blog that is currently being worked on and is going to be released uh, later today, if not early tomorrow. Uh, but pay attention to the resources that we have here. That uh, URL that you see up at the uh, right hand side of the screen is uh, where you uh, should bookmark, keep, keep that up to date. Any additional webcasts, information, and more will be on that blog in addition to uh, being tweeted out uh, by the Zans Institute. Uh, we do have about 97 questions. So uh, I don't know if Jake, Kevin, and um, uh, Tim, you could just go back on screen. What we're going to do with this is we're going to take all these questions. Uh, we have uh, the SAM staff behind the scenes that have taken all the questions uh, offline. We're going to uh, answer them individually and put them in a document on that URL uh, under the resources page here. But in order to uh, make time and uh, for uh, keeping us under the one hour mark, I'm basically going to thank our speakers and our experts that were able to put this presentation together in less than 24 hours in trying to really uh, baseline and understand what is currently known current, uh, as a result of the Ukrainian crisis. I just wanna uh, go back to each of our speakers to see if they have any additional final thoughts before we say goodbye. I'll start with Kevin who led us off. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, well, maybe one final thought on the uh, on the resources. So, as as far as I see, there's a lot of questions in there, like how where we will get the resources, where we will get the um, the uh, micro tech, for example, that I shared, things like that. Uh, I will share that with you. I guess that will then go on the blog somewhere, right? Uh, and then another thing on Conti, uh, make sure that you keep checking how they do their attacks. I mean. They probably will change some things, but they are people, right? So check how they do their stuff, check how they did any, any past attacks and try to defend against those uh, like that. They probably won't change as much in the way they are doing their attacks. That's all, thank you. All right, thanks, Kevin. Jake. Yeah, so I guess i close with the two notes, right? First, um, it is far more likely right now uh, in most organizations that you will suffer an outage uh, due to a, a self-inflicted injury uh, responding to FUD uh, than from a government, a Russian government cyber attack, right? Be that steady hand, be that calm hand, walk back through what we talked about uh, with stakeholders uh, there. And then, as you mentioned, right, getting all this stuff together uh, in, in rapid time, obviously it takes a village. I definitely want to thank all the rest of the SANS faculty, um, as well as, uh, you know, the folks over at Curated Intelligence have helped me out a bit as well. Uh, it's a nice little intelligence community. They have a free feed also. So anyway, Thank you, Jake. Tim. I just want to thank uh, Rob, the other speakers. I know um, each one of us 
could have been on here for a couple hours walking through kind of uh, very focused discussions. I think that's something we can all look to next week this is a very dynamic situation. And each one of these topics from very specific suggestions and recommendations on cyber defense or cyber threat intelligence, everybody plays a role in this um, from a defender perspective. And um, you know, definitely from a critical infrastructure and industrial control system side, um, there's a lot to consider and a lot to think about that um, I think you can look to SANS and kind of our efforts with our instructors and our vast community to kind of pull those resources together over the coming weeks. But, um, you know, for, for right now, just thinking about the people in country and kind of uh, running critical infrastructure and doing our daily jobs is really, really hard and things get uh, far more difficult when things like this and uh, escalations continue to occur. So uh, definitely thinking about the people in country. Appreciate the time, Rob. Appreciate that. And, you know, Tim, you know, you've been there and you know the people you've, you know, have many personal friends over there too. So, you know, our heart and our prayers go out to the current situation. Uh, without further ado, on behalf of the SANS Institute, uh, the instructors, authors, the SANS staff that was able to put, uh, put this together on a moment's notice, uh, truly thank everyone and thank you all the attendees uh, for attending. If you have questions, if you have thoughts, uh, again, uh, get them into the questions and Q&A right now, uh, and then we'll try to get them posted to the SANS URL, Ukraine Cyber Crisis blog. Uh, thank you again. My name is Rob Lee. I'm the Chief Curriculum Director here at the SANS Institute, and I'll see you next time.